Well, I want to um, compare and contrast uh, two different events that happen, but they're they're held together in Scripture within one. They, they they blend with each other, and this is is found. And we're not going to be going to the particular scriptures because it would take a long time to read through all of them. But this entire story is found in all three of the four Gospels. But Mark chapter five is the one that kind of um, does the best for me. So that's the one I have been reading and looking at again and delving into. And if if you um, if you you're probably familiar with this story because it has to do with a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, and a man, a Jewish uh, leader, whose daughter who was 12 years old, who was at on her deathbed. Now, the Lord has not let this these two things escape my heart as I have been uh, preparing for this time with you guys to share what the Lord has. And so, I just want to kind of go through the story. Okay, I'm not going to not going to read it. Uh, I found people pay much better attention if I just tell it. And uh, Jesus, out of all his teachings, there's only one time he stood up and read. Did you know that? Only one. When he picked up the scroll and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. And he went on and he read Isaiah. The rest of the time he stood before them speaking. He still spoke the word of God. So uh, it's, it's, it's people, people that hear stories. Storytelling is an art that um, I try to get better at every day. And it is, people would rather hear a story from you than a scripture. You, you, you're killing yourself just trying to get to somebody and talk to them about Jesus just using scriptures. And this one says this, and this one says this. No, tell them your story. Tell them your story. So, this story is uh, the two blending together. And what we have in the very beginning of this account is we have a, na- a man named, by the, ugh, my words are twisting. We have a, a man named Jairus. Everybody say Jairus. It means God is light or beholder, beholding light. And then we have a woman whose name is not mentioned. These two, these two people have a need. So Jairus, let's talk about him for just a minute. He was the ruler of the synagogue. In other words, he would have been like the pastor of the local church. He was the guy that was following the law probably better than the other people that served under him. He probably read his Torah more often. Um, He made sure that the sacrifices that were to be kept, that he kept them. He made sure that he was living according to the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, which is the Hebrew Bible. And he is uh, respected in the community and loved by the Jewish people. And and, and also we find out that he's he's a humble man. Although he is a man of knowledge and a man of uh, spiritual strength, He's also not like some of the other religious leaders we hear about. See, one thing we got to make sure is that we don't throw everybody into one pile. Because, you know, you, you've probably heard it said, and you may have even heard me say it, well, Jesus only got on the religious leaders. But listen, there were some religious leaders that believed Jesus. There were some of those guys that did what he said. There were some good ones, too. They, they were just being shut down by the loud ones that had that were concerned about themselves and their own status. But this guy obviously wasn't concerned about his status as, a, as the ruler of the synagogue when he goes to Jesus, and, um, and he's humble now. So he, 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 fi- he goes and finds Jesus and says, listen, my daughter is about to die, and I would like for you to come. I'm asking you, will you come hands, lay hands on her and heal her? And Jesus says, yes, I'll come. So... He's headed toward Jairus' house, and the crowds are coming around him because the crowds love to see the miracles. They, and who doesn't, right? Who doesn't love to see miracles? They, they love to see the miracles. Didn't mean their heart was right. Just mean they were looking for something, and Jesus even dealt with that at a couple of points in his ministry. But then there's a woman in the crowd that is not really noticed by many people because she's kind of coming in incognito, kind of quiet and low and slow and... and uh, She's a woman that has had a hemorrhage. She has had a flow of blood for 12 years that has not stopped. The only two things these two people have in common is that Jairus has a 12-year-old with a problem, and she has a 12-year-old problem. Other than that, nothing could be more, uh, there's nothing the same about these two. One of them has a right to come to Jesus, has a right to be in public, has not only a right, but has earned his way, so to speak, as a religious leader in the synagogue who's accepted Jesus, right? 
He's accepted him, and I mean, Jesus didn't, Jesus, as soon as he said, come with me, Jesus said, sure, let's go, and the whole crowd's following along, but yet then there comes this woman whose name's not mentioned, which means she wasn't very significant in that community to the people. She, um, maybe they didn't even know her name. Maybe the writer didn't even know the name of this woman, and, and uh, she's got an issue of blood. She's been bleeding for 12 years, and she doesn't have any rights. First of all, because she's a woman, she doesn't have any rights. Boy, they... If you think women have it bad today, you should have lived back then. If your husband died, you lost all your stuff. You didn't get it. Your son got it. If you had a son, if he didn't get it, it went to somebody else. You didn't get it. Aren't y'all glad y'all get your Social Security? When you, praise God for that, right? So she had she had no right to anything. She had she she was just uh, a broken and I, and forgive me, but this is the truth: subclass human being in that culture. That's what she was in that culture. Now, God didn't view her that way, but that's the way the community viewed her. And this is why she comes up behind Jesus. Jesus is coming along, and she, she comes up behind him and doesn't want to make a scene. And, and the reason she doesn't want to make a scene is because she's unclean. She doesn't want to draw any attention to herself. She just wants to, she heard about Jesus, and uh, she just said to herself, if I can get close enough to just to touch something that's touching him, I can receive it, and then I'll just shrink back into obscurity, and uh, nobody will ever know the difference. But here's the problem. The Holy Spirit allowed Jesus to feel when the power left him. Oh, my God. So he's walking along with J.R.S., probably, you know, and J.R.S. is really concerned. His, his 12-year-old daughter is about to, is right on the edge of death, and this woman comes up through the crowd that says, the Bible says that they were all pressing Jesus. So everybody was touching him, but not everybody was receiving. They're all pressing up against him, and he, she came up, and she just grabbed the, the hem of his garment, and uh, he stopped because he felt power leave. Oh. And he said, who touched me? Man, that sends chills. He said, who touched me? And the disciples said, what are you talking about? everybody's touching you. you know, I, don't, I don't mean that kind of touch. I mean the touch of faith. Who gave me the touch of faith? And it says the woman, scared and trembling, admits that she is the one that touched him. And he looks at her, he said, don't be afraid, woman. Your faith has made you whole. Her bleeding stopped. She was completely healed. So we have Jesus talking to this woman, and while this is going on, Jairus' friends show up, and they said, hey, Jairus, uh, forget about it, man. It's too late. Your daughter died. And Jesus overhears this, the scripture says, and he looks at Jairus and he said, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, Jairus, just believe. The faith that brought you here in me needs to be the same faith that walks back to your house to a corpse. How, how hard would it be for us for Jesus to say, you, you know, your kid's dead. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Just believe. <laughs> this is where the mind has to engage in something that is absolutely contrary to what we're used to. We have to ignore what seems to be evidence for a higher degree of evidence. And amazingly, and I don't know, I mean, kudos to Jairus, because Jairus did what Jesus said. And he didn't fear. And he just kept going with Jesus, and Jesus got there, and everybody's around the, the house, and, and they're crying. You know, in those days, you could make some good side money. How many of y'all like side money? <laughs> well, in those days, you could make, in, in some cultures still today, you can make some good side money being a mourner for someone when they die. Well, you don't have to know them. It's got to be a good crier. Some of y'all I know would just, you could get a job just like that. I know, <laughs> there's, people, there's people in the church, man, the wind changes. They start crying. 
And I and I, I envy you because it takes a lot. If you see me crying, something has happened. Like bad. Not like heartbreaking, like heart wrenching has happened. I just don't I don't cry easy, which is why when I got saved and I was weeping like a little baby, that was a sign from heaven. But it's just the way I'm made, it's the way that you're made. So these people were paid. I mean, I don't know if the paid staff were there yet, but they're all weeping and mourning, and Jesus walks up and he goes, Hey, knock it off. She's not dead, she's only asleep. She was actually dead. It says she was dead. What was Jesus saying? He's saying, to me, it's no different. death is no different than sleep. Oh, are you hearing me? Yeah. See, to you, it's the end. To me, I just got to wake them up. And that's why the, in the New Testament, you don't find it saying saints are dead. In the New Testament, after the book of Acts, it says they're asleep in the Lord. Glory to God. Their bodies are asleep, just resting. Spirits are with the Lord, but their bodies are asleep. And then one day they're going to get their body back without the blood, like I was talking about earlier, and they're going to be glorified. Are you looking forward to that day? Well, you won't beat them. They'll beat you. When the trumpet calls, the dead in Christ will be raised first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them into the air. But we will not precede them. They will precede us. They're going to get woke up before we get shook up. Don't be afraid. When God, when God put his spirit in you, he put spiritual DNA in you that science wishes it could replicate. He put a spiritual DNA inside of you that's designed to hear that trumpet, and when it does, it's going to click on something on the inside of you, and you're going to take on, oh my goodness, immortality instantly. Can you imagine? Your blood's going to turn to glory. Woo! And somebody cuts you, glory will come out. You imagine somebody, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, he walks into the room where the little girl is. He only takes his, top, his, his few disciples, Peter, James, and John. Takes them into the room along with the mom and dad. And he, and he looks at the little girl, and he says, little girl, get up. No different. I mean, see where Jesus is at this point? He's not in there saying, I rebuke death in my name. I mean, how would Jesus use his own name? In my name, I rebuke. He didn't rebuke death. Why? Because death had no power over him. Oh. He said, little girl, get up. Basically, he was saying, time to wake up. She sat up, started talking. Glory to God. Now, the question is this, as I get into this, do we believe, do you believe, let's make it very personal here, do you believe that when Jesus walked on the earth, that he was an illustration of God's goodness? Do we believe that? Do we believe that when you see Jesus, you've seen the Father? Do we believe that however, whatever sees Jesus doing, that we can know the Father does. Can we all agree with that? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And I know this, you know, I know you've heard this a lot of times, but man, I've, I've just got to keep saying it. You just got to keep saying some things. You cannot find in the scripture at any time that Jesus rejected a request from someone for a healing or a deliverance or a miracle. Now, there are places where it looks like he's going to, but it was only to display the great faith they had. But not once, not once did Jesus look at them and say, listen, um, that, that sickness you got, just hang in there because that's going to really bring glory to God because of, through your perseverance, many will be brought into the kingdom. Has, did he ever say that? But is that not what Christians say today when they don't receive something or someone else doesn't receive a healing? It is doctrine in the church. And, and, and if you stand up and say what I'm saying, you get beat up for it because they say, well, that can't be true. Why? Because you don't experience it. So truth now is based upon experience instead of upon what God says. I'm going to tell you all something. The truth 
is not dependent on what you and I experience. The judgment of the truth is not based on our experience with the truth. And just because we haven't experienced something doesn't mean that it is not available. More than that, it doesn't mean that it's not the will of God. Now, if there was ever one place in the Bible that Jesus withheld power and glory and healing, then I would not say what I'm saying. If there were one place, just one, where he said, you know what, I'm not going to heal you. Where Jesus chose not to heal somebody, then I would not say what I'm saying. But I have searched it, y'all. I've read it back and front, front and back. I've read the entire Bible except probably part of Numbers, which gets exhausting. You think, oh, yeah, well, you go read Numbers. And when you get done trying to figure out all them names, let me know. Because I'll have Genesis through Revelation read by the time you get done with Numbers. Does that mean Numbers doesn't have a reason? Absolutely does. That's the genealogy of Christ in there. But I've searched the Scriptures, and I've, I've never found Jesus ever saying it. Don't you think that if it were true, he would have displayed it in his ministry? At least once. But Never. Never. He always heals. He always delivers. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. I know for a fact that he didn't heal everybody. We know that because there was a leftover if he did when Peter and John, James and all the rest of the apostles, all the stories of the healings that took place, there were still sick people in Israel. Well, there was a reason for that. Either they had never encountered Jesus or they didn't believe, one of the two. The only thing that stops the manifestation of the kingdom of God is unbelief, not sin. And I'm going to be talking about this just a little bit today. Sin does not stop the flow of God. How do I know that? Because this woman that came to Jesus was in sin. Y'all know that? She was actually in sin. She wasn't like had sinned. She was actually sinning by touching him. It was a sin. She was literally a sinner sinning and got healed. Are you getting that? She was a sinner who lived in continual sin. Not that, not, uh, but I, I'd like to slap the translators that change that scripture that says does not sin to who does not habitually sin. Let me tell you something. <laughs> no, I'll just stay away from that. So we got a sinner, sneaky sinner, woman, unclean, approaching the most clean man on the planet. I mean, she wasn't even allowed to approach other people. She was approaching the high priest. It's bad enough just to approach a priest or a person because she was unclean. She was supposed to be put away. She was supposed to be hidden away. And then they would do some offerings and they would pray for her. But man, you didn't touch her because if you touched her or she touched you, you became unclean. You ever played that game freeze tag before? You know, they touch you, you're it. Well, that's how that stuff worked. That unclean stuff. Man, I am freezing up here. Somebody turn this air conditioner a little bit warmer for me. On that wall, please. Anybody else cold besides me? And if I'm cold, y'all probably are freezing. It's probably just this front. This one here runs the front. This one over here, Stacy. That one there turn on that wall. Just turn that one warmer. It'll, it'll, it'll warm up the front here. I guess I need to stir the anointing a little more. The fire of God going. Those LED lights don't put off the heat like them halogens used to be. Halogens used to make you sweat up here. Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's rethink about this picture here. Okay, so we have two people with a need coming to Jesus. One of them has all their cats in a row. They have everything proper. His name's Jairus. But he humbles himself and comes to Jesus. And he receives a miracle that day. But on the other hand, we got a woman who has no business. Who is a sinner, sinfully touching the righteous one. And she gets healed. We got Jairus who walks out in front of everybody. Hey, Jesus. Hey, yeah, me. You know, the guy that, let, the, the guy that believes in you, the, the ruler over here in the synagogue. 
publicly he comes publicly she comes secretively she doesn't she can't come you know she couldn't come publicly because she couldn't dodge the rocks let me ask you a question who was more qualified to receive a miracle from jesus Jairus or the unnamed woman of sin? Uh, here, here's the answer. Both were qualified. Because the only qualification necessary is that the giver be good. See, all my religious training, even though I was told it wasn't form that mattered, subliminally I was taught that form was the way to the Father. And I cannot tell you, and I've probably preached it, I probably, told, I probably said this, but I can't tell you many times, and you'll, you'll, you'll identify with this, if, especially if you've been in any church that really studies the Word. I was, I was told that the way to the Father was symbolized in the Old Covenant through the tabernacle, the steps to the to the, to the uh, Holy of Holies. Who ever heard that before? So first you have to come through this first area and you have to, you have to go and get washed up a bit. And then you got to go for this burnt offering. And then you, and then you got to go into the holy place, right? So there's these steps. But here's the problem. This woman didn't take any of those steps. She walked into the Holy of Holies unclean. Unclean. Not just unclean, but sinning. Walks into the Holy of Holies figuratively because that's where Jesus is. And, and doesn't just walk in, but actually takes hold of the high priest in the Holy of Holies. See, here's the way we think. Well, I just got to make sure I got through, go through everything right. You know, before I go up for prayer... Uh, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta quit doing this. I gotta start doing this. And I gotta, I gotta, uh, you know, I believe in the grace of God, but you know, He has to require something of me. The only thing required is the goodness of the giver. That's the only. The only thing required is is He willing. That's the only thing. That's the. He, he's the one that holds it, and He gives it to whomever He pleases. So I used to have faith in form. I had faith in form. So if I did it, if I, if I dotted all my I's and crossed all my T's, then I had a legitimate right to come before the Father to make my request known to Him. That was Jairus. But now I've learned that I don't have to do any of that. That in the middle of my failure, in the middle of my unclean action or life, I could come right up to the Father and touch Him and receive from Him. It all comes down to this. If we really want to experience what God has for us, we've got to quit having faith in our faith. We've got to have faith in the goodness of God. That He is good. And that he is not holding back from us because of the way we are living even right now. The greatest miracles in my ministry have been for people who were without God and sinners and sinning and live drunk and, and received miracles. Drunk. I was more surprised that God healed a drunk than I was that God healed, healed him. Why? Because I was judging it as if the cross never happened. How do I develop faith in the goodness of God? Here's how. I let Jesus become the answer to the question. Whatever question I have, find Jesus, find the answer. 
Do I need to line up? No. I don't have to line up to find grace. In fact, the very thought that I have to line up will hinder me from getting what grace has given me. I used to think that to walk in the power of God, to walk in an anointing, I'm talking about that life-giving anointing. I used to think that I had to at least hit a certain level in my lifestyle, in my Bible reading, and in my commitment. But I learned that the goodness of God outweighs the failure of any person. And some of my greatest lessons have come by seeing other people that when I looked at them in ministry, I said, they aren't even going to heaven after what they just did. I'm talking about ministers of the gospel. I'm talking about people in charge of a, a church. And I, I've seen things, and I have knowledge of things that are not good. But what, what blew my mind was that the blessing of God still flowed on that ministry. And I could not reconcile that with my thoughts. How is it, Lord, that you're still blessing a person who's cursing other people, who's hurting other people? How can you do it, Lord? And you know what the answer is? The answer is found in Mark chapter 5. From the sinner to the disciplined one, the only thing required is to come to Jesus. That's all it is. There's no other requirement for you today. Wherever you're at in your life, the only requirement to get something great from God is just come to Jesus. Just step up to him and say, I have need of this or I want this from you, Lord. And he, I love that scripture that says he no longer counts, he doesn't count our sin against us. He's not waiting for us to get things right. And man, that is a lie the devil's been selling the church for so many years. He's not waiting for us to get things right for the glory to be exposed in our life, for the glory to fill this building, for the glory to flood your hearts. He's not waiting for you to get anything right because he would be waiting forever. That'd be pointless. He's not waiting on that. He's waiting on one thing, for us to believe in his goodness. Jesus could not do many great miracles in his hometown. But it was only because they had a hard time believing in him. It says he couldn't do any great miracles in his hometown because they wouldn't believe. They just, they wouldn't believe. But yet, somehow we have twisted it around to think that the reason miracles aren't happening is because of sin. This story proves that the blessing of God is not hindered by sinful lifestyle. Pastor, I don't know why you're preaching that. Here's why, because I know it's true. And because I have no interest in controlling you and trying to get you to live right. What I'm saying is that the kindness of the Lord will bring change to your life. I'm just saying that if you'll just start looking at him and his goodness instead of judging your place in life, instead of judging what you're doing or judging your sin, if you'll just start looking and start judging him as faithful, judging him as good, judging him as wanting to bless you, wanting to pour out his blessing on you, if you'll start doing that, then the blessing of the Lord flowing in your life, it automatically begins to change your lifestyle. You begin to give honor to the Lord. You begin to, you begin to drop things in your life because of his goodness, not because you're trying to get his goodness. The day I got saved, the night I got saved and filled the Holy Spirit, I began a journey of walking in the power of God that for me I had never seen. Every, every, every person that I prayed for received a miracle. Every. Not 50%, not 70%, and I'm talking about in a time frame here. I can't tell you how long the time went. 
but it was a significant amount of time. I was walking in authority. I was walking in the anointing. I was walking all that stuff. But, but here's the thing. You know what I wasn't doing? I wasn't spending hours in this. I wasn't. I wasn't even getting down on my knees and praying by my bed. I, I wasn't. The miracles started flowing through me the moment I got saved. The, the Lord began to speak to me about people that were in the audience, and I'd lay hands on them. They were healed instantly. I, I had not had time to do any good works. I had not had time to become a Jairus. And you know when that began to wane? When that miraculous power began to drop away? Was when I started listening to people saying, oh, you got to make sure you're doing this right. you got to make sure you're doing that right. You start examining. Examine yourself. Examine, examine, examine. So I would. I started examining myself. I went, oh, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Well, there goes the anointing. You know what? My faith in the goodness of God was dropped. And because of my faith in the, not because of my sin. Can I tell you all something? I wasn't any cleaner the day I got saved than I was five years after I got saved. <coughs> But I judged myself as unclean. If you've read about the Old Testament and the way the sacrifices were done, when the, when the, when the sinner brought the lamb to the priest, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? For that sacrifice, that, that priest would, would, would slice that throat of that lamb right there and the blood would run down into the water. It was a picture of the blood and the water of Jesus flowing to cleanse the sin. And when he would, when he would kill that, when he would look at that lamb, the priest would take the lamb. Like here, let's say, let's say this is the lamb. Come here, Dylan. Dylan's the sinner. Fits him, fits him well. <laughs> He's the sinner, and he has a problem. It's called sin. But he has an offering, which is the lamb. So here's what happens. He, he hands the lamb over to the priest, okay? And here's what the priest does. Here's, this is not what the priest does. Do you know why? Because he knows he's unclean. If he wasn't unclean, he would just show up and go, here I am. But because he had to bring a sacrifice, he's, he's, he, he looks at the sacrifice. Good job, Dylan. You brought a, a spotless lamb. So, you know what? You're forgiven. Okay. Can I just tell you nothing's changed? Nothing's changed. The Father is looking at the Lamb of God, not you. Get your eyes off yourself. He is not looking at the sinner. He's not looking at the redeemed. He's looking at the Lamb. So you know what that tells me? That means I need to quit looking in the mirror at me making judgments that God has placed on the Lamb. He looks at the Lamb and he inspects the Lamb. So... Am I fit for a miracle in Christ? Because he's looking at him. Yeah, Jesus. So the more, and what is that? That's the goodness of God. And I'm just telling y'all, if you can believe what I'm telling you right now, you're like, oh yeah, praise God. If I, you could just believe this, the limitations will be lifted off of your life and the power of God will begin to flow and you will see the miraculous. You can lay hands on people as the Holy Spirit leads you and they will be healed immediately. You can speak to things and things will happen because you are now understanding that it's all about the lamb. He's not looking at you. He knows you need that lamb. He's not interested in looking at your outer flesh. That's why he died. I've got a sticker, most of you know, on my mirror. I looked at it this morning, and I smiled. And it says, look who Jesus loves. Because for years, I looked in that mirror and called myself unworthy, unacceptable. For years, I looked in that, and I saw myself in the flesh, but not anymore. I'm having to retrain my brain to get it back to where it was in October of 1992 when I was walking in such glory and manifestation of his presence apart from any works, apart from any Bible training, apart from anything else except the goodness of God. And you know, I have people try to tell me, well, you know, God just, 
He just graced you with that for that period to show you what you could build up to. Okay, first of all, God's not a cheater. And second of all, he doesn't toy with us. If you can believe what I'm telling you today, that in Christ you are whole, in Christ you are clean, in Christ you have a right, you have an inheritance, in Christ the glory dwells in you, Jesus lives in you. The man whose glory left his body is residing in you right now. In, he is in you. He is in you. And all you have to do is believe that. And if you don't believe it, he'll not be able to do many great works because of your unbelief. Mm. I think it's interesting that the Lord put these two events together. Because I think it covers everybody. Right? Because some of you in here have been real faithful. Don't raise your hands because then you'll be full of pride. Some of you have been, hey, some of y'all been faithful. Some of y'all are like Jairus. And listen, you got respect for Jairus. Let me tell you something about Jairus. Let's not, let's not knock what he did. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. The woman wasn't. Okay, let's just be honest. Uh, he was impacting lives. She wasn't. But did that make her less valuable to the Father? And today, because of the interaction with Christ, she's impacting our lives. But let's just look at their situation as it was in that day. Jairus, faithful. And not only did he not miss church, he opened the doors, and he lined up the speakers, and he made sure that the sound system was working, which was different than today. They used acoustics. He made sure the acoustics was working, made sure no walls had fallen down. And uh, so this guy was the guy that you could, you could aspire to and go, man, he's a good guy. He was. Uh, he was the pastor, and he wasn't just a pastor. He was a good pastor. He was, he was a humble pastor. We see that. He goes to Jesus. He's humble. He's accepted Christ. But, but, but then we got the woman who also represents some of y'all and, so, and all of us at some point. Amen? All of us at some point. But listen to me, they both got a miracle. So what does that tell us? That tells us that wherever you are, from A to Z, from Jairus to the woman without a name, today, who did no good, she did nothing, there's nothing recorded about anything good she did, there's nothing recorded about, she wasn't even, she was just trying to steal a miracle. Think about it. Stealing a miracle is what she was doing. Oh, sneak in. I'll come into the church, get my healing, and run out. Wasn't even going to leave no money in the offering box. And the glory, wham, filled her up. And Jesus said there's no reason to be shaken and afraid. Hmm. That's good stuff right there. I wish that I could melt it down. And open up your mind and fill it with this truth. And here's why. You're not going to get any more saved than you are. But my God, you can turn your world upside down if you will believe this. There will be people get around you and feel the anointing of God on you because you believe that he is good and that he wants to bless you and he wants to use you. There will be people that get around you and begin to cry and don't even know why they're crying because of his goodness and your faith in his goodness. And that's what we need to restore is a faith in the goodness of God. Listen, my faith wavers when it comes to my ability to do something. It wavers his never wavers so i just work on developing inside of me he's good he's just good and i and i ask him to do things based on his goodness i ask him to manifest in this building because of his goodness i no longer say well lord you know i've spent a lot of time praying and i've i've done this and i've done that which is basically what jairus was doing i don't do that anymore i just come i just come as a right a rightful heir to the blessing 
And I'm retraining my mind to believe that He is good all the time to all people in all circumstances. And He is not withholding healing or miraculous intervention. He's not withholding that at all. It is all a matter of what we believe. Hallelujah. Let's all stand.